the discovery of a haunting crime scene revolving around a 17-year-old boy, Gavin Smith, that forever altered the lives of all those involved, changing his family's peaceful existence. We'll delve into the details of the chilling secrets of the crime scene, from the initial disbelief that shielded Gavin from suspicion, the involvement of his girlfriend, and ultimately the fair judgment delivered by a conscientious judge. How did a young soul end up on such a path? In the winter of 2020, Elkview in West Virginia, a knit community, experienced a tragedy that left them reeling. Weeks before Christmas, news broke out about a homicide that cast a dark shadow over their usually joyous holiday season. The shocking revelation spread throughout their streets. An entire family had been ruthlessly murdered while they slept. No signs of struggle or disturbance were found at the scene, leaving everyone stunned by this act. The weapons used in these killings were discovered abandoned within their home walls, a silence replacing vibrant energy. To make things more mysterious, one member of the family was noticeably absent. Elkview can be found near Charleston, which happens to be the state capital and the largest city in the county. However, the area is not as urbanized. Daniel Long and his wife, Risa Saunders Long, resided in Elkview with Risa's two sons, Gavin Smith, 16, and Gage Ripley, 12. The couple also had a three-year-old son named Jameson Long. The relationship between Gavin Smith and his family was not that good. Even though Gavin wanted to have fun outside, he couldn't go out much. His family had a bunch of rules that made him feel trapped. Then, because of COVID, he had to stay home all the time and become homeschooled. His parents went the extra mile and put locks on the fridge and doors. This eventually led to a chain of events that had some really serious consequences. The Incident On December 13, 2020, Reese's father, Timothy Saunders, became concerned when he couldn't reach his daughter. He had called the day before with no response and tried again that morning but no one answered. Growing increasingly concerned, Timothy quickly drove to his family's home on Cemetery Hill Drive around 10.30 a.m. that day. The neighborhood appeared peaceful as usual, but when he tried to enter his daughter's house, it was locked. So he let himself inside, and upon entering the house, he discovered that the interior of the house was eerily quiet and dark, with no lights turned on. Timothy cautiously searched the house, eventually making his way to the master bedroom. In there, he tragically found his 39-year-old daughter, Risa May, and her husband, Daniel Long, both deceased with gunshot wounds to their heads. To his horror, he also discovered his grandson, Gage, lying on the floor at the foot of the bed in the same room. Overwhelmed with sorrow, he rushed outside and immediately contacted emergency services at 911. He could only convey that his family had been killed in an apparent act of violence and that he had been unable to wake them. Unfortunately, he had no further details to provide the operator. When the sheriff's deputies arrived at the scene, they discovered another victim, young Jameson, who had suffered the same gunshot wound on the head as his family members in his bedroom. However, another family member was missing at that time. 16-year-old Gavin was not present in the house and attempts to reach him were unsuccessful. As hours passed by, things got really tense when Gavin Smith couldn't be found. His grandpa, Timothy Saunders, and the police were seriously worried. They were looking and looking, but Gavin was nowhere to be seen. At the same time, the police were also on high alert. They thought maybe Gavin had run away from the murderer or had been kidnapped. They started looking everywhere, asking people for any info that could help. At this point, nobody was thinking that Gavin could have done anything wrong. At present, the authorities are in the early stages of the investigation. They are meticulously collecting evidence and conducting a thorough examination of the residents. Due to the preliminary nature of the investigation, there is limited information available to share with the public at this time. The focus is on verifying and confirming all details before making any public statements. From the statement of the sheriff, they still didn't suspect the missing Gavin Smith at all. Upon searching the house, the police discovered both a handgun and a large knife. 
Autopsies and forensic analysis later revealed that each family member had suffered a single close-range gunshot wound to the head, likely fired from a distance of about one foot. It was determined that the shooting had occurred several days prior to their discovery on December 13th, with the most probable date being December 9th. In the immediate aftermath of the discovery, very few details were released, and it took a few days to publicly confirm the identities of the victims. The authorities assured the public that the neighborhood remained safe, emphasizing that this was an isolated incident and that the family had been specifically targeted for personal reasons. As hours passed by, the investigation continued, and concerns about a potential murderer hiding in the neighborhood began to circulate. Since it's a massacre of four people and one more person is still missing, during the investigation, they decided that ensuring the safety of 16-year-old Gavin Smith would become the top priority. Fortunately, or unfortunately for Gavin Smith, he was located rather quickly. On the same day that his family was tragically found murdered in their home, Gavin Smith was discovered in a house on River Road in Clendenin, approximately half an hour away from Cemetery Hill Drive. The house belonged to his girlfriend Rebecca Walker's grandmother, who happened to be away at the time. When deputies entered the house, they found Gavin hiding behind a chest of drawers in a bedroom on the third floor. Nearby, they discovered several articles of Gavin's clothing that appeared to have blood stains. Subsequent testing confirmed that the blood matched that of Gavin's two younger brothers. Gavin's Arrest Gavin was taken into custody by the sheriff for questioning, and even at this early stage, the pieces of the puzzle were starting to come together. Facebook records between Gavin and Rebecca revealed that they had been in contact on December 9th, the same day the murders were believed to have occurred. It seemed that Gavin had been messaging Rebecca while traveling from his home in Elkview to Riverhaven Road in Clendenin. The messages exchanged between the young couple left little doubt as to who was responsible for the horrific massacre on Cemetery Hill. Gavin admitted to Rebecca that he had killed his youngest brother. During the interrogation, Gavin went even further and provided a full confession. However, he later claimed that he was unaware that his confession would lead to his arrest. In connection to the murders, 17-year-old Rebecca Walker was also arrested. Her correspondence with Gavin exposed her involvement as an accomplice and an accessory to the crime. Here's how Rebecca got into this whole mess with Gavin. Gavin, feeling really messed up, jumped on his bike to go over to his girlfriend's house. While she was on the way, he texted her some really creepy messages, like he's a baby murderer now because he killed Jameson and that he's currently crying. They stayed at Rebecca's house for a few days, trying to deal with what happened, probably freaking out a lot. However, things took a turn when the police arrived, searching for Gavin. Upon examining Gavin's phone, the authorities discovered evidence linking both Gavin and Rebecca to the crime. So now, they were both in trouble with the law. A little background for Rebecca. In June of 2016, parts of Virginia faced one of the most severe floods in the history of the state. The Elk River in the county overflowed its banks, causing the water level to rise up to five feet in downtown areas. This event turned out to be one of the deadliest floods ever recorded in West Virginia. Rebecca Walker and her family were among those who suffered significant losses during the flood. They lost most, if not all, of their possessions, leaving them with very little in the aftermath of the disaster. After a thorough investigation, Sheriff Mike Rutherford announced an additional arrest related to the Elkview incident that took place on Sunday. He says that this case is different from our typical ones as it involves juveniles. Due to legal restrictions and the need to avoid potential complications in the future, they cannot provide as much information as they would with adult cases. Then they apologize for the limited details at this time. Based on Gavin Smith's confession, he spent several hours hiding in the woods before making his way to Rebecca's house. He stayed there, supposedly in hiding, for four days. Disturbingly, not only did Rebecca communicate with Gavin immediately after the murders occurred, but she also chose not to report the incident to the authorities or anyone else, despite being aware of what happened on Cemetery Hill. Adding to the gravity of the situation, phone records revealed that the young couple had engaged in video calls not only after the murders, but even while they were taking place. 
The Trial At first, Gavin was formally charged with four counts of first-degree murder by a grand jury due to the severity of the crimes. Both Gavin's and Rebecca's cases were transferred to adult status in court. Finally, information began to be released to the public, and the local media in West Virginia caught a glimpse of the face of the young man who had confessed to killing his family. While Gavin awaited trial on bond, Rebecca started to cooperate and share information. Meanwhile, a doctor who examined Rebecca noted that she was socially isolated at school and struggled forming connections with others. This, along with her tragic past, made her vulnerable to her boyfriend's influence. Rebecca's lawyer, Robbie Long, described their relationship as the start of the disaster, suggesting that it was a combination of factors that led to the terrible actions committed by Gavin. Only Gavin and Rebecca truly know the details of who influenced whom in this situation. According to Rebecca's lawyer, two individuals developed unrealistic beliefs about their future as a couple. Both Gavin and Rebecca were not raised properly, as Rebecca's mother died after the flood. She experienced significant loss and was deeply saddened by the death of her mother, whom she had a close relationship with, of course. Going back, Gavin acted upon those delusions, leading to the nightmarish situation. Subsequently, Rebecca assisted in concealing him from the authorities. As a result, she finds herself there that day, accepting accountability for her actions. According to her, Gavin told her that he was being mistreated at home and desired to leave to be with her. As a girlfriend with a tragic past, she can relate to him and has a strong desire to assist him. She informed the doctors that although she wanted to help him, she lacked the knowledge to do so. In the tense courtroom, Rebecca clutched a letter she had penned. Struggling to read it aloud due to the surge of feelings overwhelming her, the letter, instead, found its way into the judge's hands. The prosecution had a strong case, revealing that Becca had prior knowledge of Gavin's sinister plan, a whole month before the tragic incident unfolded. Their focus zeroed in on Timothy, Reese's father. That one chilling fact alone seemed to justify a life sentence, as he lost his family members without any warning or a chance to make a call. It was heart-wrenching. His voice trembled as he shared how undeserving his loved ones were of such a fate. Fast forward to July 2022, Rebecca admitted her guilt as an adult, facing four counts of accessory after the fact. In a twist, the four courts of first-degree murder were dropped, and she received a 10-year sentence in exchange. Chief Deputy County Prosecutor Don Morris acknowledged that the state considered her influenced by her boyfriend, yet he disagreed with how their relationship was painted by the defense. Instead of buying the delusion narrative, he saw it as plain old selfishness. When you peel back the layers, it's clear that they put their own togetherness over the lives of four people. Now let's jump to Gavin's trial in December 2022. The prosecution played the selfishness card claiming that these heinous acts stemmed from egoistic motives. According to J.C. McCallum, the Kanawha County prosecutor, this case boils down to a messed up teenager who wiped out his family to be with the girl. Gavin's lawyer, John Sullivan, didn't deny the murders. Instead, he argued that the evidence wasn't enough for a first-degree murder conviction. He nudged the jury to focus on malice, the pivotal piece for such a charge. The defense portrayed Gavin as a homeschooled kid trapped in an abusive household, forced to care for his little three-year-old brother. The situation was so deep-rooted that the toddler even saw Gavin as his dad. This is the life of a teenager who suffered abuse from his stepfather. He was not allowed to leave the house and had no access to food at home. Just from this, you can notice how hard life must be for the teenager Gavin Smith. During the trial, Defense attorney John Sullivan informed the judge that they discovered instances where Gavin felt trapped in the house. For example, the family had put a padlock on the back door, which could only be opened from the inside. This was an unusual lock, as typically anyone can open a door from the inside to exit, but in this case, they had locked it from the outside. The statement of Deputy K.A. Cooper supports the claim that Gavin felt trapped. She states that there was a history of many runaways and the need to protect a specific individual. As a result, Child Protective Services had to be contacted. When she spoke with Gavin, he mentioned feeling overwhelmed because he was homeschooled and wanted to go to school. 
However, Gavin felt responsible for taking care of two-year-old Jameson, including feeding him and clothing him. Gavin also mentioned locks on cabinets, doors, and refrigerators. For a teenager, doing all these things instead of enjoying themselves together with his peers, Gavin felt like home was a prison. These details shed light on the various ways in which Gavin felt confined within his own home. Sullivan informed the jury about how food was locked up in the refrigerator and pantry. They presented photos from the crime scene showing padlocks on the refrigerator and cabinets to illustrate this point. They also provided evidence that Gavin had repeatedly tried to run away from home to escape the situation. There is also text message evidence that revealed Gavin's increasing anger towards the police for finding him and bringing him back home. During his testimony, Timothy Saunders told the jury that the food was sometimes locked up because the boys tended to overeat. The family was trying to make their limited food supply last throughout each month. Timothy also shared the heartbreaking moment when he entered his daughter's home to check on the family and found them in the bedroom. In the meantime, the most important witness, Rebecca Walker, testified against her ex-boyfriend, Gavin. She revealed that Gavin's mother and stepfather were against their relationship and had restricted Gavin from seeing her. However, they continued their relationship secretly through some other means like social media. Then, Rebecca explained that Gavin didn't like being told what to do including not being able to spend time with her, which was what they both wanted. This was the main reason for the events that unfolded. For Gavin, it's like the straw that broke the camel's back. Rebecca continued that in December 2020, her grandmother was going out of town. This presented an opportunity for her and Gavin to be together. She mentioned Gavin's anger over his failed attempts to escape from his family. When asked if Gavin talked about taking any action due to his anger, she stated that he talked about wanting to harm his family. Rebecca also acknowledged that this was a way for them to be together. On December 9th, the day the crime happened, Gavin and Rebecca were having a video call. During that time, Gavin was at his home, and he had a gun and a knife. Rebecca clarifies that she was not present at Gavin's house during this time. However, she was engaged in a video chat with him as the crime unfolded. Subsequently, she confesses to spurring him on by pushing for swift action in the murder of his entire family. When asked about her reasons, she clarifies that if Gavin eliminated his family, it would open up a chance for them to be together without hindrance in the future. At one point, the screen went black from Rebecca's end. When asked if she saw the gun during the video call, she confirms that she did and that it was Gavin who held the gun and knife in his hand. Judge Ballard described the murders as an act of pure evil. Ballard addressed Gavin, stating that he committed a terrible crime by killing his entire family in a cold-blooded manner. Ballard stated that Gavin planned the murders well in advance for the selfish reason of spending time with his girlfriend. The investigators found that Risa Saunders Long and Daniel Long were shot in the head while they were asleep by Gavin, and he also killed his two brothers in the same manner with the youngest brother hiding under his crib. Judge Boward mentioned that Gavin displayed no remorse, referring to reports from probation officers who claimed that Gavin believed his actions were justified. During the December 2022 trial, Gavin's lawyers objected to the prosecution's request for the maximum sentence, arguing that Smith had been in jail since his arrest. They previously argued that Gavin's home was a high-pressure environment due to a combination of his family's strict rules and the closure of schools during the COVID pandemic. The adoptive parents of Daniel Wong, along with other family members of the victims, strongly advocated for the most severe punishment. During the sentencing, Doug Wong, the father, expressed his deep emotions about his deceased son and grandchildren. He shared with WSAZ-TV that he never anticipated facing such turmoil in his life at this point. No one can predict what life brings and the circumstances surrounding this terrible murder were beyond his imagination. He was completely unprepared for the immense sorrow and pain inflicted on him and his family by this incident. The trial was short, lasting only four days. Three days were dedicated to presenting witnesses, and one day was for jury deliberations. The defendant in question, Gavin Smith, made the decision not to testify in his own defense during the trial. Instead, his legal team relied on the testimony provided by the Sheriff's Department regarding his attempts to escape 
and presented photographic evidence of padlocks found within the house. These pieces of evidence were crucial in demonstrating that he was forcibly confined. In December, after careful deliberation, Gavin Smith was ultimately declared guilty of first-degree murder for killing his mother, stepfather, and youngest brother. As a result of these reprehensible crimes, he received three life sentences. Furthermore, he was convicted of second-degree murder for killing his brother and sentenced to 40 years behind bars. Additionally, an extra term of 10 years was given due to his use of a firearm during the commission of these crimes. However, there is some leniency allowed under West Virginia state law as Gavin has the opportunity to apply for a pardon after serving 15 years into his sentence. Even though he was initially only 16, he went under trial as an adult at the time when these murders occurred, since this is allowed under West Virginia state law. Judge Kenneth Ballard stated that he only granted mercy because it was required by law. The jury agreed with prosecutors that Gavin killed his parents because they didn't want him to see his girlfriend. Evidence showed that Gavin and Rebecca Walker were on a video chat before, during, and after the murders. Rebecca claimed she didn't see the murders because the screen went black. After killing his parents, Gavin rejoined the video call, but upon hearing his youngest brother crying, he went back to end his life too. Conversely, Rebecca faced accusations of aiding Gavin's concealment and confessed to being an accessory to the crime of first-degree murder. She is currently serving a 10-year sentence. Meanwhile, Gavin is currently held at the South Central Regional Jail and Correctional Facility and will be transferred to a state prison. Rebecca is eligible for parole in June and is projected to be released on December 15, 2025. The perpetrator, driven by motives that were as complex as they were chilling, was apprehended and brought to account for his heinous actions. Not only did the conclusion of the investigation mark the end of a darker chapter in Elkview's history, but it also showcased the unwavering commitment of law enforcement. The tragedy that befell Elkview, West Virginia in the winter of 2020 serves as a reminder to us that life can be unpredictable and that we should cherish every moment.